Well, good morning, everyone. It's the Lord's Day. It's good to be with you. And I know that things have been really crazy here around uh, our country in the last few days, but I want you just to kind of set it all aside today and all the pressures and anxieties that we've been dealing with. And I want us to have this time with just the Lord. Would you pray with me, please? Almighty God, We come humbly before you this day. Open our eyes so that we can see and our ears so that we can hear and be aware of those around us who have no voice, who remain unseen to this world's uncaring eyes. As you have been merciful to us, help us to extend mercy to others. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Please join us in the singing of our first hymn.
my friends, it's time for us to pray. And I'm sure that you, just like me, have been on a roller coaster for this whole last week. And I think that many of us are probably emotionally drained and just tired of everything that's gone. So I want us to pray about that today. I want us to pray for our country, which remains deeply divided. I want us to pray for Pastor Jeff, as we always do, that God would be merciful and bring healing to his body. And I want you to be remembering all the people who have been on our prayer list and who need God's mercy during this time. Let's pray. Holy God, we come to you today with our hands stretched out to you, needing your peace, needing you to take the anxiousness of our lives in these situations that we've been in and take it away. And Lord, as we've talked about before, what we really need is to learn those rhythms of unforced grace. Lord, I pray for Pastor Jeff today. Lord, we all lift him up before you and ask for mercy and grace and healing for his body. And Lord, bring peace to his soul and raise him up to health again. Lord, we pray for our country, which is so torn and so divided. Lord, bring peace. And Lord, for those who would bring violence and who would spread anger, God, we ask that the Holy Spirit would come and bring peace. Lord, we have so many on our prayer list for our church who are sick, who are in the hospital. Lord, have mercy. Hear our prayers for our community. And Lord, for our church today, we pray. Lord, let our church be a beacon of light, a beacon of the kingdom of God throughout Springfield and Northern Virginia. Lord, may we embody the reign of Christ here and now. So Lord, we close our time of prayer by praying the prayer you taught your disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. <laughs>
reading from the book of Genesis, chapter 4, verses 1 to 8. The man had intercourse with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain, saying, I have produced a male child with the help of the Lord. And she gave birth to his brother Abel. Abel became a herder of flocks, and Cain a tiller of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought an offering to the Lord for the fruit of the ground, while Abel, for his part, brought the fatty portion of the firstlings of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and dejected. And the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why are you dejected? If you act rightly, you will be accepted. But if not, sin lies in wait at the door. It's urgent is for you yet. You can rule over it. Cain said to his brother Abel, Let us go out in the field. When they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. A reading from Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 46. Verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit upon his glorious throne, and all the nations will be assembled before him. And he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd separates his sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right, and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on, and the king will say to those on his right, "Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food; I was thirsty." And you gave me drink, a stranger, and you welcomed me, naked, and you clothed me, ill, and you cared for me, in prison, and you visited me. And the righteous will answer him and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty, or give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you ill or in prison and visit you? And the king will say to them and reply, Amen, I say to you, whatever you did for one of these least brothers of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you accursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. A stranger, and you gave me no welcome. Naked, and you gave me no clothing. Ill, or in prison, and you did not care for me. And they will answer and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or ill, or in prison? and did not minister to your, your needs? You answer them, Amen, I say to you, what you did not do for one of these least ones, you did not do for me. And these will go off to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. We look at the book of Genesis as being the oldest because it begins our Christian Bible with a creation story. Now, I want to say before I get even started, I love the book of Genesis. It's one of my favorite books of the Bible. I know it's got, it's, you know, is it myth? Is it real? Who, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's still my favorite book. I love Genesis. But I want to share some things with you about Genesis today that you may not have known. Genesis is actually not the oldest book in the Bible. Did you know that? Most biblical scholars today consider Genesis to be the newest or the youngest book of the Old Testament. In fact, it comes into its final form 
after the Babylonian captivity of Israel, which is all throughout Kings and Chronicles leads us up to that. You've got Ezra and Nehemiah and Esther and all those books all come after the captivity. And at some point during this time is also when they receive Genesis. So when you read Genesis, you're reading accounts and stories that are being presented to the Jewish people as they are returning from captivity. The Genesis stories then, now understand this, this is important. The Genesis stories are as much about teaching lessons as they are about historical figures. Have you ever wondered why it is that whenever we read Genesis, there's so many stories and lessons to be learned? That's not by coincidence. That's the point of this book. It's about teaching these lessons. So that leads us to our first text today. And if Genesis is my favorite book of the Bible, which I think it may be, although that in 1 John and I don't know. I just love Genesis. I don't know if it's my favorite or not. But my absolute favorite story, and this is undeniable for me, is our text today, the Cain and Abel story. I love the Cain and Abel story. I believe it has so much to teach us. Now, let me just say this from the outset. Whether or not they were real or this is, or not, whether these are real historical figures or not, it's not the point. It really isn't the point of the story. Because there's something to be taught here, something, a lesson to be learned, and it's vitally important that we get it. So what do we know about this story? This is after Adam and Eve have been removed from the garden. Eve give, gives birth to Cain first, then she gives birth to Abel. And then the story features a pair of sacrifices. One is favored and one is not. Now it's been said that this story gives us an indication as to what kind of sacrifice God prefers. Fruits and vegetables over lambs and sheep. This is, I believe, a completely misguided interpretation. I don't think that's what this story is about at all. And some people have used this story to, to prove certain atonement theories about why Jesus had to die. It has nothing to do with that at all. So I want you to see this now. The word in the Hebrew for sacrifice that's mentioned in this story is not the same one that is used to denote a guilt or sin sacrifice in the Bible. The word is used as a simple offering or tribute. It's a gift. So it has nothing to do with their sins. So, so it has nothing to do with the actual sacrifice itself. Well, what do we know about these two brothers? Well, Cain is firstborn. What does it mean to be firstborn? Again, consider throughout the book of Genesis, you see this, right? And then consider when this was being received by the, Israeli, the Israelite people coming back, this idea or, or theme of birthright, of firstborn. And now we get back to it, and, and as it's being written, you can kind of see that the importance that you're going to see here. Cain is firstborn, and actually his name comes in, and she says, I have named him Cain because the Lord has given me a son. Right? He has the birthright. When we read in the story that Cain is offering up the fruit of the ground, then, we're not being told that he was just a farmer. No, no, no. What we're being told is that Cain is offering up what already belongs to him. This is his. The land belongs to him. Well, what about Abel? Abel was a keeper of the sheep. Shepherds almost never owned their own sheep. They tended the flocks that belonged to someone else. So now, let's consider, what are we really seeing here in this story? And again, this is why I really love this story. What are we seeing? This story is about power, wealth, and outsiders. You're like, Tim, what are you... That's kind of a reach. Is it? Let's take a look. Cain is firstborn and has everything. Abel has nothing. Well, what do you mean? How, how, how is that even possible? 
How can you pull that out of that scripture? That's a great question. But let's look at the names that they've been given. As I already told you, Cain means the Lord has given me a son. Right? But in Hebrew, look at the name Abel. In Hebrew, his name means breath, futility. And by breath, it's like futility, meaninglessness, worthless. That's what the name means. The Lord has given me a son, and over here is worthless. Read in isolation, this might be a stretch, but, but when you put it together in the rest of the arc of Genesis, it starts to make sense, and it really starts to fit perfectly. Well, what do you mean? Well, let me tell you. Consider this. The patriarch Abraham comes from the line of Shem, the second son of Noah. Abraham almost certainly wasn't the eldest son of Terah, might have actually been the youngest, and yet he was favored. What about Isaac? Ah, the promised son, and yet not the firstborn. Who was Abraham's firstborn? Ishmael, and yet who was favored? Jacob, born after Esau, and yet God favors him. Joseph was the youngest brother of Jacob's sons until Benjamin, who was born later. And then the larger story of the Bible, what about David? The last of Jesse's sons. So what's the point here? God continually favors those who are outside of power, who have nothing, and who may or may not be oppressed as well. So now we get back to this story, again, which is being presented all these years later. There's a dialogue between Cain and God in this story, right? We go back and we look at it. Even though no favor has been given to Cain and his offering, God still speaks gently to Cain, telling him the reason why his offering has not been favored and why he has not been favored. Listen to what he says. If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. This is a teaching moment for Cain. God comes and both of them bring their offerings and he has favor on one and on Cain's is like, no. And Cain goes down and he sulks and he's upset. He's like, I've been rejected. I'm the first one. How can this even happen? Oh, Mr. Worthless over here gets God's favor and I don't. But God comes and speaks to him gently. If you do what's right, won't you be accepted? Why are you so downcast? It's a teaching moment. While he's not being favored by God, understand this, he's not being rejected either. And that's very important. Because just because God does not favor someone doesn't mean God rejects that person. Now, I know what you're thinking right now. God doesn't play favorites. We'll get to that in just a minute. Let's stay right in the story for a minute, but we are going to come to that point. So Cain... So Cain has God talk to him, try to teach him what's going on. But then what do we hear? What about Abel? What do we hear from Abel? Go back and look at the story. What do we hear from him? Nothing. In this story, nothing is said by or heard from Abel. You could almost say that Abel has no voice, because in our story, he doesn't. So, not only does he have no possessions, not only is he in what would be considered in Israel's day, remember when, this, when they're getting this story, in Israel's day to be a dishonored profession, he has no voice, except God hears him, and God notices him. 
So now this story starts to make a little more sense, doesn't it? God's choice of who is favored and who is not favored has absolutely nothing to do with the offering. This is not about the lamb or the fruits and vegetables. This is all about power and powerless. It has everything to do with who is making the offering. Not what the offering is, who is making the offering. Look at verse 7. It says this, If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? Cain has not been living in a way that would honor his position. If you do what's right, you're going to be accepted. For the oppressed, the outsider, in our society, in our world, the powerless, God takes their side, favors them, and self-identifies with them. What do you mean self-identifies? Look at what Jesus says in our second text that we had. Whatever you did for the least of these, you did it for me. But then he also says, I tell you the truth, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do it for me. Jesus is putting himself in the position of those who are sick, who are in jail, who are homeless, who are naked, who are powerless. He is self-identifying with them. He is going and standing among them. So you say, well, God doesn't play favorites. Well, when he says, when you, well, I'm right here with them, hmm. But lest you think that this is just me coming up with something interesting or some kind of point that's out in left field, let me read you a few things out of the Scriptures. Because there is a constant theme throughout Scriptures of this very idea. Deuteronomy 10.18 says this, He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the alien, giving them food and clothing. Isaiah 1.17, Learn to do right. Seek justice. Encourage the impressed. Defend the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Isaiah 10.1 and 2, Woe to those who decree iniquitous decrees. And the writers who keep writing oppression to turn aside the needy from justice and to rob the poor of my people of their right, that widows may be their spoil and that they may make the fatherless their prey. Whoa. Isaiah 58, 6 and 7. Is not this the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of wickedness. To undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and to bring the homeless poor into your house? Oh, here, listen to this. When you see the naked, to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh. Zechariah 9, 7, 9 and 10. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Administer True justice. Show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the alien or the poor. You're seeing this constant theme. Why don't we bring up the New Testament? Sermon on the Mount begins with, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. But let's go on. Let's look further. In the New Testament... In John, you have the woman who's caught in adultery, brought by all the elders and, and leaders of the city. Not just Pharisees, mind you, but lots of people coming. 
And here she is. And they're all ready to stone her. And Jesus defends her and takes her cause. We also see in John the blind man healed by Jesus and cast out of the synagogue. Jesus heals him. He can see now. And they bring him in and they say, Jesus is wrong. And he says, I don't know if he's wrong or not, but I was blind and now I can see. And they throw him out. And Jesus goes and says, I'm the Messiah. Stands and takes his case. What about the Samaritan woman at the well? She stands it there. She's there to get water by herself. She has lived a life that most in that time would be considered horrible, scandalous. Five husbands she's had. And she's living with somebody right now who's not even her husband. And Jesus says, I don't really care about that. I just want you to get me some water. And I want to tell you about living, about, about the water of life and living water. And I want to make you whole. And finally, let's think about the cross. We talk about the, the crucifixion of our Lord, and, and then we go right on to the resurrection. It's everything's all great. Jesus knew what was coming. Understand. He tells them early on, if you want to be my disciple, you have to take up your cross and follow me. And so it's like, whoa, you're talking about crosses. Jesus knew this was going to be what was going to happen. If I be lifted up, I will draw him into me. He's not talking about, hey, let's make big the name of Jesus. No, no, no. He was talking about being crucified. Crucifixion was the way that the Romans chose to absolutely dehumanize someone. They were nailed to wood, hung out in the environment, in the open, and left. Taking away someone's entire humanity. Outside of the city. Even Roman citizens who were guilty would be beheaded. Well, you got the death sentence, but we're going to do it in a way that you won't suffer. No, but not the ones we want to torture. Not the ones who can't speak for themselves. Not the ones who can't defend themselves. No, no, no. We're going to make examples of them. We're going to crucify them. And so Jesus, knowing what's coming... Even telling Pilate, I could have 10,000 angels come and defend me. But I'm here, nonetheless. And so he is crucified. Paul brings this up as well. Because the Corinthians didn't want to talk about the cross. Fleming Rutledge has written an amazing book on the crucifixion. And she says that Paul comes and tells them, he says, I didn't, decided to know nothing among you except for Christ and him crucified. Why? Because they didn't want to have anything to do with the cross. It was an insult. It was embarrassing. They are Roman citizens, and they don't want to have anything to do with this because this, this is our new religion, but we don't want to talk about that. And Paul says, no, it is central. It is central. It was a scandal. That the Messiah would be crucified. And the Corinthian church, guess what? We're disappointed in that. We've been talking for three weeks now about the disappointing Messiah. And here we are, Jesus, self-identifying with the people who are the most out of the power, who have no voice, who cannot stand on their own, who are victims of oppression. And those around who are part of these systems are all disappointed in this. God comes, and he looks across the world, and he views those who are being oppressed, who are outside of the halls and wealth of power. And he stands among them. And he said, when you do to one of them, you do it to me. This is... Such a huge scandal. This is why the cross was a scandal. It's why Paul says that, that it was so scandalous. Nobody wanted to be a part of that. It is incredibly disappointing that your Messiah was hung on a tree. And the Corinthian church wanted nothing to do with it. And yet Paul says, tough. It is the absolute embodiment of who God is. Self-sacrificial, taking the side of the outcast, 
saying, when you have done to the least of these, you have done it to me. So what does that mean for us? It means that those of us who have means, we cannot turn blind eyes to those who are outcast, to those who are outside of power, to those who are oppressed. It means we need to speak up for injustice when we see it. And it means that we need to understand that God takes very seriously how we treat those who he would consider, who we consider to be the least of these. It's great that we say Jesus is Lord. It's great that we do these things. It's great that we lift his name on high as we should. But oh, we always have to remember that how we treat the least of these is vitally important to what God says. My friends, let us be a people who join with God, who join with the Savior and say, we will stand with them. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Please join us for the singing of our next hymn. My friends, I hope you have a wonderful week. And I would encourage you to spend time with the Lord and just say, God, bring peace to our anxious world. Bring peace to my anxious heart. Help us to be people of the kingdom of God. And let our prayer be, God, help us to always notice the least of these. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Amen.